Bello. <laughs> oh, little Mai, you're such a troll. Oh, you know, few things in this world filled me with as much joy as Moomin. I wasn't really that aware of the series until about a year ago when a good friend of mine introduced me to it, and I'm forever grateful to him that he did, because this right here, it's something special, all right? Created by Finnish author Tove Jansson back in the late 1940s, Moomin was a series of children's books set in a magical, sometimes whimsical, sometimes adventurous, and sometimes philosophical world of Moomin Valley, home to many happy and quirky folks like the titular family of domestic Moomins, fussy Hamulins, mischievous Mimbles, prim and proper filly junks, and all sorts of strange creatures like the electrical Hattie Fatners, the ice-cold Broke, and the ginormous Edward the Booble. The books were a runaway success in Scandinavia and the rest of Europe, and the Moomins have since become cultural icons in their native country of Finland. Following the books was a long-running newspaper comic strip, as well as several TV adaptations. The one most people are probably familiar with is the 1990 animated series from Japan. They're known as Tanushi Moomin Ika, or just Moomin in English-speaking territories. It faithfully adapted several of the original stories from the books and the comics while putting its own spin on things, and naturally, following the series' success, a feature-length film based on the second book in the series was also produced, which serves as kind of an origin story as it shows how most of the principal characters first met. This is Comet and Moomin Lion. There's just one small problem with this movie. For whatever reason, it never got an English dub or any kind of release in English-speaking territory, so I'm stopped watching it in Japanese with English subtitles, but hey, I take what I can get. I mean, it's still Moomin, it doesn't matter what language it's in, right? Speak for yourself, Agogo. The Swedish version will always be the best. Little Norwegians? What are you doing in my video review? I thought you said you didn't do this kind of thing. I heard you were doing the movement movies, so of course I didn't want to be left out. After all, I happen to be the good friend who first introduced you to this series. So, quit the crow, hey Akugo. Well, fair enough. I guess it might not be a bad idea to have an expert like you on hand, after all. Alright then, alone Z. Hey, that's my line. Let's just watch the movie, okay? We open on a shot of our protagonist, Moomin, mooning the audience. Really? Well, if that's your attitude, fine. Actually, this is kind of a clever nod to the original comic strip, where every new story arc would start with a similar panel of Moomin's rump. Okay, he's actually just digging up a flower for his mother's garden, when his friend Sniff comes running. Sniff's kind of an odd beast. Literally, he looks like the giant mutant offspring of a kangaroo and a rat. Well, it's only natural with parents like his. Though he doesn't even resemble his father much, apparently his father was such a loser that his genes probably got bullied away or something. Which may explain why Sniff is so greedy. He probably just doesn't want to end up a loser like his old man. Hmm, interesting theory. Though with how incompetent and cowardly he tends to be, I think some of the old man's genes did manage to slip through the cracks after all. We then cut to Moomin House, where Moomin lives with its parents, Moomin Papa and Moomin Mama. Yeah, Moomin is pretty much this world's equivalent of Smurf. While Papa is doing some DIY work and building a bridge, Mimble, a friend of the Moomins, is dropping off her little sister Mai to live with them from now on. And she immediately shows why she's my favorite character in the whole series. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes you would. She's such a precocious little brat, you just can't help but love her. The three kids then head off to the beach to go for a relaxing swim and do some deep sea diving. Well, Moomin and Mai go at least, since Sniff's such a scaredy whatever kind of animal he is that he instead just kind of wanders about and stumbles upon a cave. You know, normally I'd call a scene like this filler, but with Moomin, this is just par for the course, really. Well, it's part of the charm. Sometimes they go traveling, other times they go swimming, or sometimes they just go have pancakes around the campfire. Come sundown, the family's at home having dinner, where Moomin presents his mother with a pearl he found while diving. これは預かっておくだけにするわ。どうして？それはね、きっと近いうちにムーミンがこの真珠を心から上げたいって思う人が出てくるからよ。そんな、ママ以外にそんな人が出てくるなんて考えられない。
Give it a few years, kid. Then puberty will be all over you like a swarm of rabbit Hattie fat nurse. It's then, however, that an unexpected guest drops by in the form of the Muskrat, a grumpy philosopher who ponders the futility of life, the universe, and everything, and was apparently living in a hole in the river until Papa disturbed his home by putting a bridge over it. Naturally, he's quite a chipper fellow. <laughs> But I'm not telling it. The next morning, Moomin goes outside to find everything covered in some kind of black gunk and goes to ask the muskrat about it. I bet he's great to have around at parties. Wanting to know for sure what kind of catastrophe might be headed their way, Moomin, Sniff, and Mai decide to go out on a journey, which Papa and Mama don't really have a problem with. Most relaxed parents ever. And unfortunately, that's about all we see of them in this movie until the climax. So, off they go to find the observatory, located in... the Lonely Mountains? This is getting to be rather talky, Natsuka, all of a sudden. After about a day's worth of traveling on foot, with Sniff of course complaining every step of the way, the three notice a tent by a river and go to see who might be staying there. Well, of course, it's Snuffkin, my favorite character in this show and probably my favorite character in the entire world. You see, the thing about Snuffkin is that he is probably the most mysterious, yet somehow the most likable character I've ever seen. He's seemingly wise beyond his years. He has a sort of Gandalf type personality to him. He always seems to be one step ahead of the plot all the time and... What my esteemed colleague is trying to say is that Snufkin is a traveler. And a pretty cool guy, as well as kind of mysterious. In any case, he knows a lot about the world, and word is that the catastrophe heading for Moomin Valley is a comet that could very well cause the end of the world. That's dark. Who'd have thought a cutesy series like this would have a story about the frigging apocalypse? In any case, Snufkin agrees to join the group on their way to the observatory and even offers to let them stay in his tent for the night, thus paving the way for the inevitable Moominex Snufkin fan pairing. The next morning, the team continues on their way along the treacherous path, but Sniff continues to fear for his life every step of the way, much to little Mai's amusement. <laughs> カニ歩きの仕過ぎで普通の歩き方忘れちゃったのね。違う、僕は疲れてるんだ。何かに捕まらないと歩けないほど疲れてるんだぞ。あれだけ元気な声が出ればまだ大丈夫ね。I <笑> sound like an old married couple, except Mai is clearly wearing the pants in this relationship. <laughs> totally. Can you imagine what would happen if they ever get married and started a family? Them? Married? <laughs> uh, uh, let's not give the fanfic crowd any weird ideas and just move on, okay? Sniff perks up, however, when he hears from Snufkin that there's a ravine full of shimmering garnets up ahead. <laughs> See, this is the sort of thing that really makes me ponder about Snufkin. He, he says these few things, but it really makes you think. He, his view on ownership is something that's brought up repeatedly throughout the series. And it really seems to... I get the picture, thanks. But I agree, the mystery surrounding Snufkin and his philosophy is intriguing. But as Sniff goes down the ravine by himself, he quickly learns an important lesson on greed when he runs into a ferocious lizard.
He actually puts up a decent struggle not wanting to let his effort to get at the shiny rocks go to waste, but all for naught. <sighs> The journey continues as the group travels across a lake before going up the lonely mountains themselves, when Mai spots something shiny lying about, which turns out to be a gold bangle. Snufkin explains that it probably belongs to someone called Snork Maiden. Her scientist brother Snork apparently went to find the observatory not too long ago himself, which is when she must have lost her precious bangle somehow. Hearing about a pretty female in need, Moomin wastes no time rushing into action as he goes to retrieve the bangle. Oh, so now who's not interested in girls, eh, Moomin? It was picked up by the most unlikely creature imaginable. Finally, the group reaches the observatory, where a whole bunch of scientists are all obsessing over the comet. Moomin, on the other hand, seems more keen on finding out more about his precious Snork Maiden. Dude, you only heard about her like five minutes ago. It's a little early to get this attached to someone you haven't even met yet. Take it from someone who's had his heart broken on OK Cupid more than once. Now is this the one who's going into unnecessary detail? <clears throat> yes, quite. From the scientists, however, they learn that the comet is indeed headed for Moomin Valley and will quite likely strike in two days' time. I love how unperturbed Moomin is that little Mai just climbs up on his nose so she can look through the big telescope. Guess you get used to that sort of thing when you have to live in the same house as her. But time is short, and so the group quickly gets underway back to Moomin Valley. As they get some sleep along the way, they hear someone cry for help, and led by Moomin, they quickly go to investigate. Sniff quickly proves to be the weak link in the group once again, literally and figuratively. As Moomin and Snufkin go up ahead, they run into Snork, along with his sister who's currently caught in a massive flesh-eating bush. Moomin wastes no time trying to save her from a horrible, tentacle-filled death, and gets caught up himself. 10 out of 10 for style, but minus several million for good thinking. Snufkin and Snork then distract the plant for a bit by shouting insults at it. Baka! Baka! Baka, baka, baka! Omae wa baka da zo! Clearly his scientific degree does not extend to wisecracks. <laughs> Little Mai saves the day! Or not. Cue epic fight scene! <laughs> well, as epic as a fight scene relying on repeating the same footage over and over can be. Though it's surprisingly violent, and that music is pretty awesome. Naturally, Snork Maiden is quite impressed with her rescuer, especially when Moomin returns her bangle to her, and the two instantly become infatuated with one another. Awww. Snork, however, wonders how they're going to survive the inevitable cataclysm, which is when Sniff brings up the cave he found on the beach, and suggests they hide there when the comet hits. Huh, so he's not totally useless after all. Even if Snork Maiden does kind of steal the credit for his idea. Poor Sniff gets no respect, even when he does something right. But it's interesting to note that they're not even trying to stop the comet or anything. They're just trying to save their own skins instead. Certainly unconventional for a story like this. As they continue on their way, however, they realize that the comet's proximity is causing all of the water around them to disappear, including the entire ocean. Moving along on stilts, they quickly stumble upon a shipwreck. What's this inscribed on the blade? Sting is my name, I am the Hattie Fatner's Bane. And right on cue, the Watcher in the Water shows up when Moomin and Snork Maiden go investigate inside the wreck. And with that, I filled my quota for obligatory Lord of the Rings gags. Man, this is the second time something with tentacles has tried to eat them. How bad is their luck when the same stuff happens to them twice on the same day? Fortunately, Snork Maiden makes the save when she accidentally blinds the creature by reflecting sunlight off a mirror she found. As the group gets closer to Moomin Valley, they find several people in the process of evacuating, as the comet will strike later that day. Moomin Papa and Moomin Mama, however, apparently stayed behind, waiting for Moomin and the others. They then run into an elderly Hemulin, worrying about his stamp album, when a tornado created by the comet starts to blow ever more ferociously around them. But Moomin gets the idea to use Snufkin's tent as a glider to quickly make it back to Moomin House, with the old Hemulin reluctantly coming along. But things quickly take a turn for the worse. Oh, 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 oh,
切手私の切手、えー、命より切手の方が大事だっていうのは嘘じゃなかったのね。Yeah, in the downwards direction. Fortunately, they're saved when Moomin uses the Hemulant skirt for a parachute and Oh god, the Hemulant's on the way! Why? My eyes! As they fly towards Moomin House in their rather undignified fashion, Papa wonders what's taking everybody so long while Mama is dutifully preparing for his son's birthday. Best mother ever, even in the face of Armageddon, her first priority is always towards her family. For reals. She could be working at the restaurant at the end of the universe. Hell, when the gang finally arrives at Moomin House, she reveals she even saved the Hemulent stamps when they were blown away by the tornado. Still, after a happy reunion and dinner, they decide it's high time to skedaddle, save whatever possessions they can, and wait out the disaster in Sniff's cave. Wow, Moom and Mama's being rather brutally honest with Sniff. Yeah, when the patron saint of motherly love herself makes a crack like that, you know you failed pretty bad. So that's probably why Sniff promptly runs off to save the stray cat from the impending disaster. That, or he's just stupid. Hey, that kind of thing takes some serious guts to selflessly go out there when certain death is imminent. Well, while that's going on, the muskrat also decides to ride out the storm along with the Moomins and company and rewards them for their hospitality by sitting right on top of the birthday cake. That heartless bastard. But as the deadline creeps ever closer, Moomin becomes worried about Sniff not coming back and fears he might have gotten lost. Told you this was a bad idea. Fortunately, him and Snuff can find him in the nick of time and carry him back to the cave as he's paralyzed with fear. Big surprise. With everyone in safety, they wait in tense anticipation as Doomsday is right on their doorstep. Glowing rocks rain down from the sky while the horizon glows a fiery red. The ground and walls shake. Entire trees are blown away by the gale as the comet creeps closer and closer. Everyone huddles together in fear, waiting for the final moment until the inevitable finally happens and... The comet just flies off and everything is back to normal again? Are you freaking kidding me? Everyone lives, the ocean comes back, and they all dance merrily at their continued existence. I know this is a kid's movie and they weren't actually gonna die or anything, but come on! This is just so anticlimactic it'd be hilarious if it weren't so stupid. Well, as it happens, I do have a theory about this. Would you care to hear it? <sighs> Indulge me. See, I found this very interesting because it's a world-ending story seen through the eyes of lesser characters. And there's probably some main story in the foreground of some heroes defeating an evil combat summoning wizard, but instead we're viewing it through these characters' perspective and I like that. It's more interesting. You know what, you just pulled that out of your ass, didn't you? The, what the hell? I'll buy it. And finally, things come full circle as Moomin Mama reveals the pearl that Moomin found, and so our little lover boy offers it to his new girlfriend, ending things on a high note. So that's Comet and Moomin Land. How do I feel about it? It's pretty good, actually. It's a very unusual mix of cute and cuddly, funny characters in a pretty dark scenario, and despite it mostly being a series of random events without any real character development, there is a lot to like here. The setup is pretty unconventional, especially because this isn't the typical save the world plot. Instead, it's all about how they're trying to live through this disaster. But there's still enough room for some very enjoyable action and typical movement hijinks. The animation is great, it's a huge step upwards from the TV show, but it still retains that same delectable old-school anime flavor while being true to Tove Jansson's original works. Comet in Moomiland is a great adaptation and a great movie, I think. It's certainly outside the norm of most stories of this kind, but is ultimately better for it. The characters are great, the art is breathtaking, and if you have any childhood wonder left in you, it's sure to captivate you. I would compare this to a Studio Ghibli movie. So, all in all, it's a great little slice of fun, Moomin goodness that I never knew existed until very recently, and I'm even more grateful to know of it now. One can only hope that the upcoming Moomins on the Riviera movie can live up to this one, but from what I've seen so far, I'm definitely looking forward to that. So, Norwegians, thanks once again for introducing me, and thanks for being here as well, you spoony raccoony. Uh, not a problem, Akugo, you crazy-headed guy, you. Always a pleasure to help out a fellow lover of Moomin.
One of these days, I'm finally going to learn or turn off my phone when I'm doing one of these reviews. I could go speaking. Yeah? Yeah? Really? Huh. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Um, who was that? Oh, that was the observatory. Apparently there's a comet headed straight from my house. Shouldn't you be evacuating then? Nah. It'll probably make a huge fuss and then just fly right past my house. Uh... What now? Yeah, me again. What's that? You sure? Really? Huh. Okay, thanks. Bye. Hey, apparently they miscalculated the comet's trajectory and it was actually headed straight towards Middlesbrough, England. Hmm. Wi-Fi must be on the fritz again. Is it over?